from the heartland of America and coast to coast, this is EM Student with Professor Dan Scott. Our ability to reach unity in diversity will be the beauty and the test of our civilization. Mahatma Gandhi. Hello, my name is Daniel Scott. This is EM Student. Today, I am pleased to have a guest on the show um, to talk about inclusion and diversity. Dr. Alyssa Provencio is the Assistant Professor in Department of Public S Political Science and Masters of Public Administration program at the University of Central Oklahoma. She is also the coordinator of the Certificate in Disaster Management. She takes a number of courses in Emergency and Disaster Management, Public Administration, and Environmental and Social Justice. Uh, she teaches, I'm sorry. At uh, UCO, she is involved in several college and university committees related to diversity, equality, equity, and inclusion. Dr. Provencio's teaching and research interests include issues on gender, race, vulnerability, representative bureaucracy, consensus building, and community empowerment in emergency and disaster management. Professionally, she attributes her passion for emergency management to the time she spent in New Orleans following Hurricane Katrina. It is a pleasure to welcome Dr. Alicia Provincio to the show. Hi, Good Dan. morning. Good morning. Thanks Thank for having for, me. Thank you for joining us. This, today's uh, today's uh, topic is actually uh, of great interest to me as well. Um, and I, I know that it's a, it's a passion of yours. So um, so today we're going to talk about the, the inclusion um, of of not only women but people of color in emergency management, and not um, and and there's and there's we both have different views on that as we talked about uh, previous, uh, as far as women in emergency management and how it's perceived and and their and how what their level of involvement is in emergency management. So that's that's definitely an area that I'd like to talk to you about. Um, so before we before we get into that, though, I'd like for you to um, uh, maybe give a little overview of your of the of the certificate uh, that you offer at your institution. Absolutely. Um, thanks again for this opportunity. Um, so we do have a certificate in disaster management, which is um, a secondary certificate uh, meant to sort of uh, complement a master's degree um, or can be taken as a standalone uh, option as well. It's 12 hours um, and a bachelor's degree is required to um, enter into that program. Um, but it's also, uh, as I mentioned, a complement to other master's programs here at uh, UCO, University of Central Oklahoma. We also have a master's in public administration. And so a lot of our students uh, will get their MPA and also get the certificate in, in disaster management. So regardless of whatever position in the public sector they enter into, they have a little bit of a background on you know, what they need to do for their respective agencies to be prepared. You know, that, I think that's great as far, you know, this, this, this program is, is dedicated to those who are wanting to um, be are, are students or are planning to become students or are active practitioners who want to do continue professional development. And one of the things I love about emergency management is it can be applied in so many different industries, but there's so many different degree programs that could be applied to emergency management public administration being one of them, uh, myself uh, got my bachelor's in social welfare and it was, and, and I applied that degree in the, the, all of my research and the writings that I did based on emergency management and social welfare. And a part of that is, uh, is identifying um, those, the, the cult uh, cultural differences and, and diversity and working with those of, of uh, different levels of, of means. Um, so that brings us also to um, what we want to talk to you about today is, um, gender equality and people of color in emergency management. So let me ask, so let's start off with this. So do you think the EM profession is a, is a diverse profession? So I will say it is more diverse than it was uh, in its inception, right? So um, for mid, maybe many of your listeners, they know that emergency management as a profession um, really developed from civil defense. And so uh, in the beginning, a lot of the volunteers for civil defense agencies uh, were 
men, they were white. A lot of them uh, were taking on these positions as either volunteer opportunities or second careers, right? Where uh, they would be in the fire service or law enforcement uh, or the military. And, uh, and then they would take on these positions as civil defense coordinators. Um, and because of that history, uh, we really didn't see a lot of women in the field uh, for many decades. Um, and I would say that you know, starting in the mid 90s um, is when a lot of scholars and, and researchers um, started discussing gender differences. So how disasters and emergencies impact the genders differently or impact people of color differently or impact those with low socioeconomic status differently. And it was around then um, where we also started to see uh, an increase in the number of professional programs uh, at universities around that time. Um, and so because of all of these things converging, um, we did see more women start to enter the field through uh, education, uh, through the nonprofit sector, um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, I would still say that there is a gender imbalance, um, and I know we're going to get into the details later, um, but uh, we, we do see women in different types of positions in emergency management, and we all see also see differences in uh, leadership and in growth uh, with women in, in these agencies. Um, as far as people of color, unfortunately, um, we just do not have a lot of people of color in the emergency management field. Again, it's better than it is than it was, excuse me, 50 years ago, um, but uh, I, I don't think it is where we would like it to be and it's not as representative of our publics. Yeah, and I and I would agree with that. And I think, and as you mentioned, you know, we we come from civil defense, which was at the time was heavily military. We were planning for an attack, and it was heavily so people from the military and 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 uh, our you know the, um, the the host of Ian Weekly and the and who brings us this show, Todd DeVoe, uh, has asked me um, that question: Is do you do you think emergency management? Uh, well, we hear emergency management is driven by older white men. And uh, well, originally it was. That's the way it started, and and it has transitioned uh, to to a, a different extent now uh, than it used to be. But it's also transitioned in the way we apply it. And when we talk about diversity, in in general, um, diver emergency management itself is so diverse in the way we can apply it, in the way it's practiced, but not necessarily the way it's um, represented uh, as those who are actually doing the doing the emergency management practicing, even teaching um, at, at some at some level. So. Yeah, there's there's a there's a difference there in how we look at those things. But yes, it was heavily driven by the military, and men were um, the majority of the military back then. So, uh, and and still today, in a lot of ways. So these were things that, as we transition, and it became more emergency management and more focused on all hazard versus uh, preparing for military attack. Things started to change. But um, yes, yeah, so so why why do we not see as many women in the field? of emergency management, do you think? Um, again, I think that it's really rooted in our history. Um, so, you know, prior to us going on air, I was saying that we see a lot of differences in uh, the types of positions that women hold. And so, uh, you know, they might serve as, say, a volunteer liaison or um, in, as a grants administrator or perhaps individual assistance. But um, when you're actually looking at what we can see, consider um, operational positions, those are still, um, you know, heavily occupied by men um, and, you know, traditionally white men as well. Um, and, you know, I think that it is um, for a few reasons. One, I think that those operational positions often still require um, a an applicant to have uh, had, quote, boots on the ground experience, um, meaning that they were in law enforcement, uh, in the fire service or in the military. Um, and so there are often restrictions around, you know, who may or may not be hired into those positions. Um, but we know, right, that uh, regardless of your background, if you understand emergency management, you can succeed and do well in those positions. Um, and so, we do see that uh, that disparity uh, in operational versus quote you know administrative type of positions. 
Yeah, and I and I agree with you. And that's actually one of my uh, it's one of uh, the hangups that I have when it comes to um, not only the, the the hiring practices, but those that are doing the hiring itself have a misconception of what emergency management is. They don't they're not properly educated as well to what they're hiring an individual to do and are quite overly impressed with someone's uh, time in law enforcement and fire in the military. And that's not to say that that's not to be commended and they didn't do a great job. It doesn't mean they're going to make a great emergency manager or they know emergency management. And uh, they, they focus up so much on that first response um, as, a, as the person coming in to do that job. When emergency management in general is not a first response profession, it's a secondary response, um, even though there is response capabilities. Um, and it is heavily administrative and heavily um, guided by uh, support and coordination. Uh, we have a comment, so let's uh, go to comments. And so this is so Brian says this is right in, in my backyard. I am amazed that this flew under my radar. I am a UCO alum. Well, hey, there you go. Um, yeah, that's great to great to hear, Brian. Um, one of the reasons why it may have flew under your radar is that it's a relatively new program. It just got launched about two years ago, uh, and we are. Uh, continually developing it. So, um, you know, sort of be on the lookout for new uh, progress as we move forward. Yeah, and keep listening to future shows because I'm going to bring in more programs on, more more professors of programs from all over the country. I myself am from Oklahoma. Um, uh, Edmond is where the um, University of uh, Central Oklahoma is, and I have family that lives in uh, Edmond. Hello to them. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it was in my backyard, too. And uh, there are a lot of programs out there that I hope to be able to, uh, to bring to those that are listening, even those who are established in the profession that wanted to just go for professional development or are seeking for advancement in their career field. So, yeah, thanks for that comment. Um, but, yeah, I agree with that 100 percent as far as in the hiring practice. And I saw and this was this was just a and this brings to diversity and women in the workplaces. I saw a picture and it was a cartoon. Is it, and it was a woman sitting in front of a long table of board members saying, what do you what do you bring? Can you bring to our company that's different? And they're all men talking to a woman. And that's, you know, the answer. If you just look at the picture, you see that. And that's and that's and that is common. And I hear that. But as we talked about earlier, and I want to bring this to the to the audience is. My view, and, and I and I had mentioned this in a previous episode, my view of, of um, the representation of women in emergency management, or at least the practitioner side, is is different because I've always seen it since I started um, becoming and, and doing my my education and learning as it being pretty equal. Um, but it's because because I came up, we well, going to like EMI for my age as I started my education, where I was involved in a classroom where I saw a lot of other practitioners where there were a pretty well blended mix of, of women and men. Um, but that's not necessarily the case, you know, as far as the, the individuals that may be allowed to go to those classes and my perception of what I saw versus what's actually taking place in the workforce. So let's talk about that. Um, do you think in the, the lack of women or let's say people of color as well in the EM profession is due to an act of exclusion um, or is done purposely? Um, you know, I think that the way that systems work is that they are designed in, in exclusionary ways. Whether or not that's intentional is hard for me to say, right? But we've seen it um, throughout history. Um, you know, part of the reason why I think you're probably seeing women in some of these EMI classes or in uh, higher education is because that's actually their point of entry into the field, right? So rather than coming up through the ranks of those first responder agencies and then moving into an EM, which we see um, with a lot of men, and, his, and historically we've seen that, um, we, we see women actually coming up in to um, master's degree programs uh, and even into PhD programs and going the education route. Women are also more likely to seek professional development opportunities um, in order to make themselves viable candidates for promotion um, and you know, to be considered for other positions. And so um, there may be an equal balance in education and, and actually um, studies of EMHS uh, education have shown that it is quite balanced. Um, but again, you know, when you get into the field, particularly when you get into rural areas, 
um, you still see, you know, the white male sort of serving dual roles, perhaps as uh, the emergency manager slash uh, chief uh, of police or fire chief, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, perhaps in urban areas as well, it is a little bit more equal uh, than it is in um, those rural areas. But, you know, the wide swaths of this country that are managed by uh, rural emergency managers is, is quite large, right? Uh, and so I think it's important to consider all of those factors. And you and you made a, a great comment. And it was pr prior to the show, and it's something I'd like to to mention is is that yeah, there may be uh, uh, women that do like emergency management functions. They may be grant writers. They may be in more an administrative role or um, an assistant role versus um, going up into the um, uh, assistant director or deputy or director role. Um, let's talk about that for a minute. How 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 can we I mean, if it's despite, you know, given that there's education aspects to it and experience aspects to it, how do we how do we increase women in those types of roles? That in your opinion? Yeah. So I think um, it has to do with a couple of different factors. One, I think. As you mentioned earlier, there are still a lot of misconceptions about what it takes to be uh, an, uh, an assistant or a deputy director and a director. And um, we do find that particularly in emergency management agencies that are housed in law enforcement or fire, that they um, do require some kind of uh, boots on the ground experience. So you're automatically disqualifying a lot of uh, people who are um, or have the qualifications and skills to be a good uh, deputy or a good director, um, you know, just by how your job description is uh, created. Um, you can also look at these job descriptions and see um, what we call gendered language. So is it requiring, you know, these more technical skills that can be acquired on the job? Um, or are you talking about things like communication, networking, uh, organizational skills, management, you know, all of this, these qualities that we know that you also need to be successful uh, as a deputy or as a director. Um, and then unfortunately, in some cases, I really do think that there are still um, systems of uh, nepotism or, um, you know, sort of the part of being part of the good old boys club. Uh, and so, you know, who do we know that would be good for this position? Well, if your circle uh, doesn't include uh, people of color or women, um, you know, then potentially you're missing out on uh, qualified or overly qualified people uh, for those jobs. Yeah, and that's actually, you know, and I think I've mentioned this to you before. That's actually a chip I have when it comes, you know, it's on my shoulder as far as how that goes when it comes to the the that position, the emergency management position, um, position, being within fire or PD or EMS or however that goes, and they're not filled by an emergency manager, they're filled by someone who just said, um, "You're going to take it," like other duties as assigned, who have no real experience with emergency management, or it's even rotational. So that you have someone who goes, who's like, okay, I'm going to go in because I'm on medical leave. So I'm going to go take this role because I can sit in the office. And that's a misconception as well. Sit in the office and do this role. Well, the problem is that either they don't apply that and they don't learn the job. Or by the time they do get to learn the job, they transition out. So there's never someone there with the consistency to help drive a program. And, they're in, and when you don't have an emergency manager doing that job, it can also be applied if if I'm from law enforcement and I'm doing that that job, I kind of tend to focus more on the law enforcement aspect of it. Or if I'm from fire and I'm doing that job, I focus more on the on the fire aspect of it versus emergency management focuses on the wide range, uh, wide focus on the entire capacity of emergency management functions and capabilities. So I do have when it comes to it. And that's my goal. Um, and, and it's one of the reasons why I'm pursuing my education is in a way to help build uh, a more understanding of what that what the emergency management professional brings to an industry and why it's so important to dedicate a role to that versus other duties as assigned, which we see a lot, as you mentioned, in rural areas where you have someone who's playing, putting on multiple caps because they don't want to hire somebody else or they can't hire someone else. Um, and that's an aspect, too. They don't they don't have the money 
So it's easier for them to say, well, you're going to do this because we don't have to, we can't hire another position. And these are things that we need to, to, to really educate, not only just the public, but the, the, the government entities and the private organization, why it's so important to have somebody dedicated to emergency management, why that, that um, position needs to be there, why the profession needs to grow and why it's important. So, um, and that, but that's on us to do. Um, but ultimately we're sitting in COVID and you see all these industries and you hope they're thinking it's important now, but what we found in the United States is we have a short-term memory. So how long is, you know, how long until, until we start putting that aside again or eliminating positions. And, you know, someone told me just recently, uh, they're hiring these positions all over the place for emergency management to help with continuity, planning, a recovery, but they're, they're short-term positions that are going to go away as soon as the money's gone. So what do we really, what do we, what do we show in there? Um, and, and why, and, and that's why we see it too. And in my opinion, it's why we see a lot of retired uh, individuals coming back to work is they'll work for the money that's offered because they already have an income from their retirement uh, or their pension or, you know, so they, they don't need the money. Like it, when you, when you pay it, when you pay an emergency management professional 30,000 a year, a, a professional can't do that, but a retiree can, you know, they can work for that $30,000 a year. Um, so it makes it easier for you to say, well, I know somebody that can do the job um, because they've already, they're, they're collecting a pension. So yeah, they can take that money and get those uh, health insurance benefits. So why is it, so let's, let's ask this. So why should we make it our priority to make the EM profession even more diverse than it, than, um, it currently is or perceived to be? Yeah, so um, when you read my bio, you read that one of my interests is uh, about representative bureaucracy, which essentially is just a fancy term for representation, right? And so when we talk about a democracy, we, we elect people who represent our interests, um, but we need that in administrators as well. Um, we need people in positions who represent uh, the public. And um, we have found through research that if you have more um, diverse agencies that better represent um, the demographics of the population that they're serving, uh, some of those gaps uh, are closed. So, um, you know, when we look at the disparate impact of disasters, as I, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, if you have somebody who, uh, you know, is um, has vision impairment, right, they're going to be thinking about um, ways that emergency management can uh, help people uh, who have vision impairment, right? Um, and so this isn't just about hiring more women for the sake of hiring women or hiring more people of color for the sake of hiring more pe people of color and checking off a box. It's about having their needs and their issues represented in the agencies that are supposed to serve them. Um, and so, you know, if you have a Spanish speaker, they might be thinking about ways to better communicate uh, with the Spanish language population um, other than let's just create this content in Spanish, um, you might actually be thinking about, you know, what are the publications that Spanish speakers um, read? What are what are they watching? Um, how can we uh, better communicate with that group of people? And so, you know, it's not just emergency management. It's almost any, uh, you know, agency that is intended to serve the public. If we make it more diverse and inclusive, then we're opening doors to be better public servants. I agree with that. And also, I think um, it, it opens up a level of, of trust as well um, between those who are uh, doing the representing. Um, it's harder, and I, and I mentioned this in another episode too, it's harder when an outsider comes in who may look like me uh, versus someone who comes in that looks like them. That shows them I'm represented. I can trust that they 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 got my best interest at heart. Versus having to try and convince somebody, especially in a time where they need it the most, uh, which is what we see the most is that ahead of everything. You know, and I say this as a practitioner: the worst time you do not want to be getting to know the people you're working with in an emergency situation. You want to get to know them beforehand. You want to build that trust, build those relationships, those partnerships, uh, so you know. When emergency strikes, you've already built that trust, that camaraderie, and and you want to be doing that in advance. So, um, yeah, it may take me longer to to go into um, a Hispanic com community and build that trust 
than it would someone else who may have already go in there and can build it a lot quicker than them. But ultimately, if you do look like me, I can still do that. Just it may take me a little longer. But ultimately, it's up to me to go out and do that in a way that doesn't misrepresent or uh, hurt the community by doing it too late. And that's what we see a lot. We're we are very very response oriented as a as a uh, as a nation. Uh, there's not a lot of prevention, mitigation, and preparedness versus the response and recovery aspect of it. We spend a lot of money on those two areas, and I feel very. Um, uh, I think we should be spending a lot of our time on mitigation, prevention, and preparedness, and building those those relationships, and and all up in, up front, so that and when stuff happens. We're not trying to convince somebody. We're trying to help them. You know, we're, they know we're trying to help. Them. So as we as we uh, as we sum up, should we actively target women or people of color to encourage their involvement in the emergency management profession? Yeah, I mean, I think a couple of things need to happen. Um, maybe more than a couple of things. Um, I think we really need to take a good hard look at how job description, descriptions are written. Um, we need to take a look at what we're asking uh, in terms of qualifications. Um, you know, are they really things that are necessary to get the job done and to get the job done well? Um, could we be opening our recruitment um, I guess the scope of our recruitment even broader than we are uh, beyond people that we that we know. Um, and I also think that we need to do a lot of work in addressing organizational culture as well. Um, I mentioned to you that this topic was something that I did uh, for my dissertation. Um, and uh, in that, you know, we still found that there were pretty high incidents of um, perceived discrimination and then also experiences of um, harassment. So, you know, whether we're talking about just uh, a joke here and there or, you know, all the way to physical assault um, and not always within organizations, but um, also with partner agencies. So going out into the field, perhaps, and um, having something happen to you and then having that incident not being taken seriously. And so if we want women or people of color um, to feel welcome and feel included, right, that that's a part of the work that we as a uh, as a profession need to work on as well is, you know, what kind of um, agency are we bringing women? Are we bringing people of color? Are we bringing people with disabilities? Are we bringing LGBTQ plus um, populations into? And do they feel like they can do their best work in the environment that they're in? Um, and so, you know, I think part of it is, yes, we need to do a better job at recru recruiting women, but we also need to do a better job at retaining them and promoting them into positions with influence. Very well said. So let me pose this, this question for self-reflection to all of our, uh, our listeners and those who may be watching is ask yourself, what have you done lately to expand your knowledge and understanding of diversity? Because there's a difference there, having a knowledge and an understanding of diversity. So as we as we sum up and, and, I, and I'm ending uh, the interview today, I want to um, remind everybody to look at uh, EM Weekly and and um, listen to Todd DeBow on Thursdays. I'd like to thank very much Dr. Provencio uh, for coming on this morning. Your um, your knowledge of this uh, specific topic is uh, is always great to have a conversation with you. And uh, as I, you know, your time is very valuable. And I, you know, I, the fact that you offered that up to me today, I, I, I very much appreciate that. So thank you for coming on and then having this conversation with me. Well, thank you so much, Dan. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. And uh, so, so everybody, as we sum up and as we finish out, I uh, just want you to know that uh, I appreciate you taking the time to listen. Um, these are um, topics that we bring to you, not only for um, self-reflection, but reflection just to look in and help build the profession, build you as a student, build you as a professional. This is Dan Scott. Thanks for listening. Thank <laughs> you.